Okay, I've got some diffraction gratings. So what this is, is somebody has taken and cut a whole bunch of little grooves in here. It's 600 grooves per millimeter. This one is 300 grooves per millimeter, and this one is 100 grooves per millimeter. And they're useful for finding the wavelength of light because you're gonna get an interference pattern. So when I shoot this through, you'll see these bright spots where there's constructive interference. Now they're pretty close together with the 100. When I go up to the 300 lines per millimeter, the lines are closer together on this. The grooves are closer together. Now the bright spots get further apart. And when I go to 600, they get even further apart. But I said it was useful for finding the wavelength. So I'm going to switch to the green laser now, still with the 600. And now look at how far apart they are, even further apart. And if I go to the red with the 600, that is even further apart. So the longer the wavelength, it seems like the further apart the bright spots are getting. And the closer together the lines, the further apart the bright spots are getting. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what's happening. This is called diffraction. So diffraction is a way that light bends around objects or around barriers. And you actually can see this if you look at flat waves, like flat wave fronts when they come into like a little harbor. Let's say that there's like a little tiny opening here. These waves will fan out. And that's called diffraction. Well, if I had two of these openings, so we'll make another opening here. This wave is gonna fan out as well. All right, well, any time that these waves meet at the same spot, we're gonna get a bright spot because the crests will meet crests and you're gonna get an interference pattern, right? So another way to think of this is if Somehow I were to zoom in and look at those little slits. Now I said there were 600 of them cut per millimeter, so I would have to be really zoomed in. But like, let's say there's slit one and there's slit two. And here is my screen over here, all right? So right in the center between those slits, uh, is that in the center between the slits? Maybe down a little bit. Right in the center between those slits, I would expect that the path length from slit one to there and from slit two to there is the same number of wavelengths. You know, there's been many wavelengths for, for the light that came through each slit, but they've gone the same number of wavelengths to get to right here. So that is constructive interference because the waves are in phase, right? There is gonna be another point again where they're in phase, where the light coming from slit two and the light coming from slit one are off by exactly one lambda off. We're gonna be in phase again. Obviously this path length is not the same as this path length, but if they're off by one lambda, what slit one has done exactly one extra wave, then we're gonna get constructive interference again. So it's like the light was these waves coming in and hitting these slits it goes through both slits at the same time and the light coming through one slit interferes with the light coming through the other, All right? Well, this is multiplied with the, with the diffraction gradient where you have many little slits cut. And so the math on it, and I'm not gonna bother to try to prove the math to you, says that we can use this equation, m lambda equals d sine theta. All right, well, m is the order of the bright spot. So that's gonna be like one, two, three, right? So this would be like your first order bright spot. The next one out here would be your second order bright spot, so on, okay? Lambda is the wavelength we're looking for. So I've already been saying for purple lasers, that's 400 nanometers. For green, it's about 500 nanometers, right? So that will be the wavelength. D is the distance between slits And then if I were to draw this picture, I'll draw it a little bit better. If we were to draw a line right from the center to here, and then out to there, 
that angle will, will usually work for us for theta. Now they're probably not gonna give you that, but since it's such a small angle, we pretend like the sine of theta is equal to the tangent of theta, because it pretty much is for most small angles. If you're in degree mode, you can check this out in your calculator, like put in the sine of 10 and the tangent of 10. I bet you get really close to the same thing. And especially like the sine of one and the tangent of one. So if this angle is small, the tangent of theta is x over l. And so I'm gonna replace the sine of theta with x over l. Okay, what was x over l again? x was how far apart the bright spots are. And l is how far the screen is from the grating. So if you ever wonder, well, how do they know the purple laser is 400 nanometers? Well, they use m lambda equals d x over l, the diffraction grating equation. Okay, here I have some diffraction grating glasses. They're actually like diffraction gratings cut in two different dimensions. And they take white light and they actually make it into a spectrum because each light diffracts at a different angle as we just talked about, each color does. So you can kind of see some rainbows when I look at the white lights in the classroom. Now, when I look at the purple laser on the board, you can see that there's a whole grid of dots. But something kind of interesting, when it goes to the smart board, now you're actually going to see rainbows in addition to a grid of dots. You see some rainbows. It looks much more cool if you actually have them on. But that's because on the smart board, purple or UV light, that purple laser has some UV light in it, will actually make certain white things fluoresce, where when it's on the regular board, it doesn't fluoresce, it's just purple. All right, so white light is a reflection of all colors of light. Black light is absorption of all colors of light. Uh, Isaac Newton was the first person to figure out that you could separate white light into a spectrum, which you probably have all done with a prism, and that's called dispersion. It's where you take the fact that each color is going to slow down a little different amount when it enters a new medium like glass, and you use that to separate light into a spectrum. Same thing happens when light enters water, it separates into a spectrum. Now, if the two sides of the medium are parallel, like a pane of glass, you don't see this. So you need a shape like a prism where the, the effect isn't undone on the opposite side or like a raindrop. You, you get the light separated by dispersion. So I just wanted to show you a little bit about mixing colors of light in case you ever do any light shows or something like that. So here I have a red light. Let's see if I can get them separated. Kind of blue light, red light, green light. So you can see, probably didn't expect this, but the red and green makes yellow. Red and green mix to make yellow, which on the Roy G. Bev, yellow is between red and green. Red and blue mix to make uh, violet or magenta, it's actually called. And in our eyes, we actually only have a red, blue, and a green cone cell. So if the red cone cell and the blue cone cell are getting activated, you're gonna say, oh, I bet I'm seeing magenta. If the red and green are getting activated, you're gonna, you're gonna think you're seeing yellow. So when it comes to mixing light, uh, our eyes are kind of already good at, at doing this process as well. So what happens when you mix all colors of light? Well, we've already talked about how if you mix red, green, and blue, it makes white light. Now that's not a perfect white, but it's kind of close to white light. All right, so these ones that are opposite of each other are what we call complementary colors. So cyan is kind of like green and blue together. That is opposite of red, because cyan doesn't contain any red, it contains blue and green. The two primaries it has are blue and green, and so if you mix it with red, you're gonna get white. Yellow contains red and green, red and green, so if you mix it with magenta, you're gonna get white. And uh, what is the last pair? Blue mixes with yellow to make white. So there's lots of different ways to make white light. Um, these are what we call the additive primary colors of light because as you mix more and more light, the more you mix, the whiter it gets. Pigments, not so. Like if you've been mixing a lot of paint, you notice that it doesn't get whiter the more you mix. It usually turns brown or maybe even black. 
That's because the more pigments you have, the more they absorb. Um, if I mix two colors of clay, which here I have some yellow clay, which you can kind of see that in the white light, and some cyan clay, you can actually predict what color they're gonna make. And here's how I predict it. I use the subtractive process. So I know that yellow is red and green. It reflects red and green. I guess the only color it absorbs is blue. And cyan reflects blue and green, and the only color it absorbs is red. So this one absorbs blue, this one absorbs red. So if I mix them together, blue and red are gone, and the only thing that's left to reflect is green. Right, that's called the subtractive process. It's kind of confusing, but um, another fun thing to do is kind of guess, well, what color will things look under different color light? So under white light, yellow looks yellow. No surprise, it reflects yellow. It's the only color it doesn't really use is yellow. Kind of like how plants, the only color they don't use is green. A plant's least favorite color is green, apparently. All right, so yellow reflects red and green. So if I put it under green, you can see it reflecting green. If I put it under yellow, you can see it reflecting red and green. If I put it under red, you can see it reflecting red. If I put it under purple, you can see it reflecting kind of red. If I put it under blue, it's not gonna really reflect anything. It looks pretty black. And here it's gonna reflect only green under the cyan. Same thing with the cyan clay. If I put the cyan, this, the white, it reflects cyan. Cyan, it reflects cyan. Blue, just blue. Just blue. Nothing, it should look totally black. Here, it's just green reflecting, and just green reflecting, and then back to cyan. Right, so there's a way that I can hide this message with these polarizing filters. So what polarizing filters do is they block out the light in one plane. Well, if I can block perpendicular planes, then no light will get through. So I like to think of this like a vertical and a horizontal fence. If you have a, a vertical and a horizontal fence, then they can block everything out. Where if they're both vertical, stuff can still get through. So if I have these two filters, both vertical, you can still see the screen, but if I turn them like this, you can't. Now, an interesting thing about polarizing filters is if I put something diagonal like this, either in front of both of them or behind both of them, you still can't see. But if I put it in between them, diagonal, it makes it so you can see. This is kind of a hint on how LCDs work because it turns out that LCDs are polarized. And they're actually polarized at kind of a goopy angle. Why are they polarized? Well, there's actually a liquid crystal molecule that responds to voltage because it's a polar molecule. And when you apply a voltage to it, all the molecules line up. And when they line up, they make it so the light can't get through because this screen has a polarizer like this and a polarizer like this. And that liquid crystal is sandwiched in between there. And so what they do is they etch the back side of the polarizer and the front side of this polarizer so that those liquid crystals will twist. And with it, they'll make the light twist so that it can get through and you can see. But when you apply a voltage to a pixel, instead of twisting, the, the liquid crystal will snap to a, a vertical position and the light won't get through. So they have transistors that can give a voltage with a one or no voltage with a zero to every pixel on this screen. Now, if this was in 1080, which it's not, you'd have 1,080 pixels per square inch getting a one or zero at whatever your refresh rate is, maybe 120 times per second. And so we'd have to have a lot of information for that so that... Uh, you could tell the voltage to turn on or off so that you could let light through to a pixel. And then each pixel has three different colors that it can do. So if you zoom right in, you can maybe even see really close to the computer that there's a red, blue, green dot on every single one of these. Now with my TV, I have 256 shades of red, 256 shades of blue, and 256 shades of green that I can get with each pixel which if you multiply that out, there's about 16 million colors I can make.